um, that is, that speaks to the constitution which regulates um, the enjoyment of these rights. We have the public benefits organizations. If you ask me whether um, the government of the day has done enough to protect civic, civic, civic space, I would tell you no. Um, I think there are still um, many government uh, agents or officers who are still suffering from the, from the past. Who still think that some um, these rights are donated by the government of the day, which is not true. The role of the government of the day is only to protect the individual or even the people to enjoy those rights. Say done enough in which direction? If you say done enough in uh, reducing the space, then they are doing more than enough in reducing the space. But if you say done enough in realizing the space, that does not appear to be the intention from where we sit. Since this regime came into power, we've seen that space being limited, not just for civil society, but for the media, for individual human rights defenders, for bloggers, for journalists, um, for everybody who needs to operate in that space, including individual citizens who are well-meaning. Um, we've seen this being done in several ways. So I've talked about the use of le legislation. Um, we've seen a lot of retrogressive legislation coming in, from the amendments to the PBO Act, um, from the security law amendments, from the laws on the media, that instead of providing a thriving and encouraging an environment where civil space grows, where citizens can actively engage, what we are seeing is that that space is being reduced so that citizens can only contribute and can only speak to the manner in which government dictates. And criticism is not tolerated. Um, and I don't think that is what we dreamt of as Kenyans. The government has an obligation to protect the civic space. But systematically, since 2013, we have seen the government clamping down on the civic space, restricting it further. For example, the PBO Act 2013, which was assented to by the former president, Mwai Kibaki, till to, till to date, the government has failed to commence that PBO Act. And that PBO Act actually is uh, a part and parcel of protection of the civic space. Secondly, we have seen, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, we have seen uh, deliberate uh, clamping down on spaces, like if you go to spaces like Mungala Manaji spaces, you go to spaces where people meet regularly, we have seen thus infiltration of those spaces by agents. We have seen uh, government uh, closing down, coming up with the laws, like for example, the security laws that requires people uh, to seek for permission to meet. We have seen systematic amendments of the police law. We have seen systematic amendments of the, of the media laws. We have seen systematic amendments to laws that allow people to assemble. So the government is instead of protecting civic space, it has been cannibalizing that space and today, as I can say that the space is becoming smaller and smaller because people no longer meet. If you go to the estates where people used to meet uh, regularly, we have seen the police coming to those meetings, harassing people, arresting people, and doing things like that. So the government needs to up their socks because they have a responsibility to protect and defend the civic space. Uh, we have seen uh, some of the actions of the uh, current uh, government, uh, um, um, which um, has a very good credential or very good credentials in terms of fighting corruption. Uh, some of the actions now seem to suggest uh, that an environment is being created where it will be extremely difficult for civil society organizations uh, to operate freely uh, and therefore amounting to an attack on freedom of association. Uh, of course, we have also seen that the media uh, has also suffered quite a bit, so freedom of of, of, of speech, freedom of the media, all these seem to be under attack from a regime that initially uh, East Africans uh, hoped that um, that regime would create an environment uh, where civil society is free to operate, and envi an environment, therefore, that would have allowed a more institutionalized fight against corruption, uh, uh, because that was seen as one of the signal uh, uh, priorities of, of the new regime. So we have seen this now coming up as a trend uh, across the region. Uh, back in Kenya, of course, the issue is whether or not the uh, PBO Act uh, of 2013 uh, will, will ever be implemented without the kind of uh, 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 very restrictive amendments that have been suggested uh, before. That leads me to the conclusion that governments 
have not really been doing much uh, to protect the civic space. In fact, governments have become the main enemy of growing the civic space. So civil society organizations, the media, the opposition have been left operating in a very restrictive uh, uh, environment. In terms of the government and what they've done to protect civic space, I think the government, if, if it was up to government, they would happily close the civic space as, as it were. And in Kenya particularly, since the Jubilee government took power, we have seen a continuous and very deliberate attempt to close on civic space. It began with amendment of um, the laws on security and peaceful assembly, by, by there being extraordinary measures taken for assembly and association in the guise of countering terrorism. Thus, particular security amendment laws were contested and some of it was successful, but that right there was a blatant attempt by the government to close on civic space. The much we have been able to, to, to achieve as a country, uh, it has been achieved through this civic space. Um, those who are keen to follow up the history of this country, they'll remember um, the, the, the issue of multi-party democracy. It was achieved through dialogue, through people being in the street, and even others paying ultimate price with their life. So this civic space is very important. In particular, with regard to civic space, I think the civil society sector or the public benefit organization sector has uh, undergone uh, a very, I would say, a, a rough um, a period uh, since the 2013 general elections in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the, the operating environment for the civil society, non-government organizations um, have been significantly hampered or challenged by the government's um, absolute refusal to commence uh, PBO Act 2013, which was signed into law uh, by the former president Kibaki in January 2013 and is yet to be operationalized, is yet to be uh, commenced uh, by the state for reasons that are not clear up to now. And that law particularly creates a very good framework, uh, legal, uh, for even self-regulation. Uh, it uh, sets a higher standard of accountability for the sector. It also creates significant structures for collaboration between the state and um, uh, the public benefit organizations or NGOs in that sense. So I think if there's one serious indictment or one indicator of um, a deteriorating uh, uh, civic space, um, uh, or actions or inactions that have undermined uh, a, a, a meaningful uh, engagement and thriving of the sector and civic space broadly speaking is the refusal by the state to date uh, to enact, uh, to operationalize and to commence uh, the PBO Act 2013. Has done enough in protecting civic space. Um, the first, um, the first um Example of this is the fact that we do not still have a, a law or policy that protects the rights of NGOs and human rights defenders to undertake their work, which basically operates within the civic space. Uh, we have the Public Benefits Organizations Act, which was passed in January of 2013, which however to this date has never been implemented. Civil society organizations are still struggling to have this act put in place because the act will provide a, a legal framework that is transparent and that enables the expansion of civic space. So I wouldn't say the government has done enough in protecting civic space. The civic space um, has, uh, has, has significantly reduced since 2013. We've had um, members of parliament who have been actively working with civil society to try to push for the um, try to push for the enactment of the Public Benefits Organizations Act, which would be critical in the regulation of the public benefits sector. Uh, however, from 2013 to date, that act has still not yet been um, operationalized. Then we also have the passage of the Freedom of Information Act, which plays a critical role in enabling uh, citizens and human rights defenders to be able to demand 
for their for their rights through um, accessing information that they require to enable them to do so. So there are a few things that the government has done and that the government has tried to put in place to be able to enable the citizenry to um, realize these rights but all in all there is still that limitation of rights and we accept that you cannot 100% realize rights but um, the government should be able to ensure that citizens in Kenya are um, realizing or are accessing, are, are able to access the freedom of association, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly without um, undue interference by the state. We have also seen uh, government coming up with a very punitive reporting and registration mechanisms. We have also seen situations where uh, governments are also threatened to re register and also freeze accounts of different uh, actors in the society. So that has been basically the, the challenge. And uh, therefore, the government has been the key perpetrator of these atrocities. And I think the idea of governments committing these atrocities is to ensure that there is a minimum uh, confidence by different institutions toward them to account so that everybody wants to be compliant or want to, to impress the, the government. Basically, governments are afraid of increasing empowerment and also capacity of the citizens and also the institutions which, which go with them, that is the civil society, independent commissions, the faith-based organizations, among others. Uh, there was also again uh, early uh, last year when uh, civil society organizations under the leadership of the Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, organized a demonstration to protest against uh, a skyrocketing corruption in this republic. Again, uh, the state uh, came up in full force and disrupted those meetings in a manner uh, that only helped to confirm that uh, the government is not keen uh, to respect, uh, to protect, and to fulfill uh, the rights uh, and, uh, to freedoms of association, expression, uh, and assembly as, as guaranteed in the Constitution. So I would say in a nutshell that the status of the freedom of freedoms of association, of assembly, and of expression are constricted uh, in the Republic of Kenya at this point in time. And as you, have, uh, you will remember, we saw recently government warning against any uh, demonstrations uh, that people, any group of citizens may want to hold ahead of and after the elections. Uh, that again is an, a, an indication that uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association and freedom of assembly uh, is very much restricted in this country. I think the, the way forward has got very much to do with what levels of citizen efforts will continue to be made. If citizens remain engaged and remain in a a mode where they're protecting their right to participate and their right to, uh, to, to remain engaged, uh, then it will become more difficult for the ongoing crackdown to succeed. Um, if, on the other hand, citizens withdraw, if, with, if citizens yield the space they already hold, then it is more likely that the crackdown will succeed and we can't foretell uh, the extent of that success, if the if the crackdown goes be uh, more than 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 currently exists, it could become a lot more worrisome. But everything really depends on the willingness and uh, sophistication of citizens who have done a, a good job of protecting the space that they already hold against um, uh, against the threats that 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 we face. Um, so it, it depends on the extent to which citizens are willing and able to organize to, to keep vigilance and to, to, to protect and maintain the space that already exists. For a start, it would be um, to have the Public Benefits Organizations Act enforced. So this would require commitment and goodwill from the government to operationalize the Act. On the part of civil society, it would be to come together and uh, to collaborate in lobbying and getting these acts passed, I mean, uh, operationalized by the government. 
Secondly, um, it would be for the government, especially the organs that are involved in executing some of these practices that have been seen to shrink or to limit the civic space. For example, the organs that are involved in um, security agents that are involved in violently uh, disrupting peaceful protests by citizens and by human rights defenders and by civil society organizations to stop uh, these practices which are unconstitutional, um, which I think is doable immediately. So um, it would be for the organs themselves to have the commitment to protect the rights of citizens uh, by refraining from some of these acts that actually limit and curtail civic space. We have been training uh, community uh, people on how best they can be able, um, if they, they, they found themselves uh, in the court of law, how best they can be able um, to defend their rights um, through the legal way. And we train them on legal issues and we undertake them through um, civic training uh, with, uh, in our own initiative. And that is another aspect of civic space, because without civic space, it would be so hard to organize those people, to train them, uh, to give them the necessary knowledge and the know-how. So for us, it's key that this civic space must be guided because of the benefit that, uh, that, 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 that comes with those civic space. Okay, as the way forward, the government should stop looking at the civil society and the social movement as its enemies. Instead, the government should look at them as partners because what these groups are doing is that they're helping the government to ensure that it fulfills its obligation. So the government should, first of all, uh, ensure that the PBO Act 2013, that was assented to by the former president, is implemented or is, uh, is assented, uh, I mean, is commenced. To date, he has not done that. The government should ensure that the police reforms, the security reforms that were envisaged in the 2010 constitution are implemented to the letter. The government should ensure that Article 3 the government should actually respect Article 3, which obligates it to respect, to protect, and to defend the Constitution of Kenya 2010, which includes the rights of Kenyans. So the government should fulfill its obligation. It should not fear Kenyans. We are not enemies. We are friends, and we want to help the government do their work effectively. So my way forward is that the government should go back to the Constitution, read it, and ask themselves, where did the rain start beating them? And then from there, we'll have these things happen, working well. Thank you. I'll speak to the way forward for two sectors largely. So for civil society and for government. For civil society, the way forward is quite clear. Number one, we must be eternally vigilant because the attacks on the sector have not stopped. They are going to continue and they're only going to get worse. And um, so we must be prepared to see them wherever.